Good evening. I want, to, I want to start by first off again expressing the gratitude and the thanks that Terry expressed this morning for all of your generosity and your love and your affection, not only especially during this time, but all throughout the year. It is greatly appreciated. The second thing I want to do is warn you. See, normally I start my work week on Tuesday. I sit down at my desk Tuesday morning. I would like to say the first thing I do is turn on my computer, but the first thing I do is I turn on the coffee. And I, you, normally what happens is I sit there and I start writing out ideas of what could become sermons or classes or lessons, and I'll have a couple rough outlines. And then by Tuesday, I usually steer all of my attention into one and begin working on that. Well, that didn't happen this week. And normally by Friday, I have one complete lesson or sermon or class. And this week, I sat down at my desk on Tuesday morning, I turned on the coffee, then my computer, and I started sketching out some ideas, and I don't know what happened, but Friday came, and I didn't have one complete sermon. What I had was five short devotionals, or five short sermons. And unfortunately, they were all kind of time sensitive, so they're all happening tonight. We'll try to make this quick. Maybe my attempt to make this quick will mean we'll get out early, or maybe I'll fail completely and we'll be here all night. But the whole steaming or the idea behind these short series of lessons is I wish it was Christmas every single day of the year. And that's not because of I want the gifts or I want to give gifts or the envelope of money that Terry mentioned this morning that, again, we're very thankful for. If you want to make that an everyday occurrence, I won't, I won't argue too hard. But that's not the reason I wish it was Christmas every single day of the year. Honestly, it's not even Christmas Day. It's the things that we talk about during the Christmas season. It's the stories we tell, the movies we watch, the lessons that we as a society hold as important during the month of December, November included, and January included. If you're in my household, I'm sorry we start celebrating Christmas before we do Thanksgiving. But it's the stories we tell and what we talk about. It's the movies we watch. Christmas stories, although often fictional, often serve as profound reflections of who we are as a people, who we are in human nature, what we value as a society. And frankly, the other 11 months of the year, it feels as if, at least in my point of view, that the rest of the world, we as a society, don't place much value in anything positive until December comes around, and then all of a sudden, we start talking about love and giving and change and what it means to serve and to care and to help other people. I think about Charles Dickens' A Christmas Story, which, by the way, this Tuesday, I believe, marked its 100th anniversary from being published. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, it's a timeless story about transformation, about resilience, about a person who, Ebenezer Scrooge, who is pretty much the definition, the starkest portrayal possible of what it means to live a solitude, a life of solitude, and a life of misery. And he begins to go through this haunting transformation, and I say haunting quite literally. Now, I know it's a Christmas movie, but right off the bat, we have three ghosts. We have past, present, and then the ghosts of the future, or the potential future. And led by these ghosts of Christmas, Scrooge looks at who he is as a person. His past reveals all the missed opportunities that he has had, the missed opportunities for joy, the missed opportunities for connection, the missed opportunities for family. And then in the present, it shows that how his current actions, which are based on those past missed opportunities, how those current actions impact the lives of those around him. And spoiler alert, if you haven't read the book or seen any of the hundreds, multiple hundreds, maybe thousands of adaptions that have been made for TV and movie over the past hundred years. Spoiler alert, um, he doesn't treat people very well. And then in the future, or what I would like to call his potential future, it shows a lonely and sad end. It shows him what would happen to him in his life if he continues on the path that he has been living. And these encounters with these ghosts are the catalyst for a profound change, leading for Ebenezer Scrooge to embrace a spirit of generosity and of kindness. It symbolizes the power of redemption and repentance. 
And when I try to think of a biblical narrative to Ebenezer Scrooge, to Charles Dickens, to Christmas Carol, there's a lot that you could go for. The obvious one is Paul, and we've talked about that in the past, actually. I talked about it in July. Uh, Paul is a Scrooge who undergoes a profound change. But I also think about Luke chapter 19. I think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector in Jericho, and tax collectors were often despised in Jewish society for their collaboration and corroboration with the Roman Empire and their frequent exploitation for their own monetary gain and how they may or may not have turned their backs on their own people to make a few dollars. And apparently people didn't like that. So they didn't, so Zacchaeus wasn't a very much loved man and he wasn't very much a good man at the beginning of his journey. He did those things to people. He defrauded people. He wronged people. He turned his back on what you would call his people in order to make a little bit of money. But then in Luke chapter 19, he meets a man named Jesus. And by the end of that story, in verse 8, it says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold the Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, initially portrays Ebenezer Scrooge as a man, as a symbol of greed, in solitude, and he's led on this transformative journey, and in the same way, we meet Zacchaeus, and he is a symbol of greed and solitude, and then he does two of the R words we talked about earlier. He is redeemed by his faith in Jesus, and he repents. And repentance, I think, is the word that we know here in the church world, right? True repentance involves a heart of examining our own lives, recognizing our own wrongs, seeing what we did to get into the situation that we are now in, looking at the ghosts of Christmas past, recognizing our present, the impact we have on the people around us, and looking towards our future. What changes do we need to make in order to be different, in order to be redeemed, in order to live the life that God intends for us? Repentance. See, that's, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is one of my favorites. It's the Nutcracker. The Nutcracker is a magical story. Right? It weaves a tale of childhood wonder and bravery and the ongoing and never-ending battle between good and evil. And the journey of this story, depending on its adaptations, follows a protagonist. Typically, it's a young girl often named Clara. And Clara goes into this fantastical world that highlights the power of imagination, the power of belief, shows the miraculous. And in this allegorical narrative, it showcases the triumph of good over evil and the bravery of children, emphasizing the power that is in the purity and the strength found in childlike faith and childlike wonder. And I think it's pretty obvious where my brain goes when I start to define the nutcracker in that sense. I turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, and Jesus says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I think we have to start to define a few things when we look at these verses. When we try to tie the ideas of Jesus' teaching of childlike wonder to the story of the nutcracker, I think we have to understand what it means to become like a child. Because childlike awe, as seen in the Nutcracker, as talked about by Jesus here, is not ignorance. It's not being naive. It's not being foolish. It's not being silly. It's not being childish. Rather, it's the profound sense of wonder and the openness to the things that you don't understand. Because as a child, you don't understand a lot of things. A lot of things you don't understand, and yet you take them at face value because the people you trust and you care about tell them to you. It's about belief. It's about opening your heart to the change that could possibly happen, to the things you don't understand, what God has in store for you, even though that you in the presence right here, right now, don't understand. A childlike faith is characterized by trust and simplicity and an eagerness to embrace God and his teachings and the wonders of the world that he has in store for you, even though you don't know what that future looks like. Those are the first two lessons I thought about, and those are what I would call classic Christmas tales. And now you can tell that classic includes things that are only 100 
years old. Now we're going to move towards contemporary Christmas tales. And contemporary Christmas tales, I have three of them. The first two are from the early 2000s, and then the third is nearly as old as the classic tales as it's, it's a Wonderful Life. It's from 1946, which isn't quite 100 years old, but it's closer in time to Charles Dickens than it is the Polar Express. And the Polar Express is the first one I wanted to touch on because I think the message that it teaches about child life wander and belief and faith ties directly into the same ones we talk about when we talk about the Nutcracker. The Polar Express is a film from 2004. If you have not yet seen it, I think you have had plenty of time to see it. Some people love it. Some people think it is a magical and beautiful movie, and I love the story. But I will admit, it is one of the few movies that I have watched that hurts my eyeballs. The animation in that movie terrified me when I was young, and it terrifies me now. It is weird and uncanny. And I will admit, it takes away from the core message, but we're going to focus only on the message right now. You see, the Polar Express, it centers on a young boy's journey of skepticism, right? He starts off unsure of his belief in Santa. His adventure to the North Pole aboard a magical Polar Express train becomes a metaphor for a journey of faith. There's this bell that is only heard by those who truly believe, believing in what they cannot see or easily prove. And this journey reflects the challenges and the rewards of maintaining a faith, especially in the face of doubt and uncertainty. And when I think about the Polar Express and I look for a biblical parallel, I think of Hebrews 11, chapter, Hebrews 11, chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. See, the Polar Express invites us to reflect on moments when our faith is tested, when the people around us are doubting, when we ourselves are starting to fall into those same doubts as the people around us. And what happens in those moments of doubt when we choose to believe, when we choose to counter the things that are standing in the way of our faith, when we choose to take them head on? In these moments, like the boy hearing the bell, our faith calls us to hold on to our belief in God's goodness and his overarching plan for our lives. Even though we cannot see God physically, we can look around us just like the boy on this magical train going to the North Pole. We can look around the world that we live in and see the evidence of God, just as he looked around and saw the evidence of magic around him. So when I think about the Polar Express, I think about the steadfastness, the holding on to the faith even in the midst of challenges, even when you don't see God or his actions in the world around you, because that doesn't mean that God's not there. This means you close your eyes to that childlike wonder, that you close your eyes to what is possible with a faith in a God who can do anything. Moving on to our second contemporary Christmas tale is the movie Elf from 2003. See, an elf, Buddy is a man, a full-grown adult. One doesn't know he's a full-grown adult, nor knows he's human. He thinks he's an elf. And because of these two major things that he's been misled on in his life, he is filled with this infectious joy and innocence, and he stands out starkly against the backdrop of a cynical world. His journey starts off in the North Pole in Santa's workshop where everything is magical and cheery and happy and childlike. And he quickly moves to the big cynical city of New York. And you can imagine as a person who is joyous and childlike and innocent, moving to a big city like New York, you have two options. One is you can let that beat you down and break you and form you into the rest of the world around you, or you can stand out. And the movie Elf, although supposedly about Christmas, I think it's more about this full-grown adult man running around New York City spreading cheer and happiness and joy in the face of everybody who is angry at him for doing so. When I think about standing up for joy, even when the world around you says otherwise, I think of Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, because Buddy's infectious joy and enthusiasm reflects our biblical call to find joy in circumstances 
that are good and in circumstances that aren't so good. And infectious joy is, at its essence, optimism, relentless optimism, that good can overcome evil, that joy can break down and defeat sadness, that light is stronger than darkness. And throughout this film and throughout our Christian walk, we see that time and time again, that joy is stronger than any darkness in the world, that joy in the Lord is one of the most powerful tools that we as Christians have. And yet, as people who live in this metaphorical New York, in this cynical world where everybody around us is grumpy and cranky and complaining that the world is on fire and everybody hates each other and there's war everywhere and nothing ever good can happen, I think we start to stop standing out. We stop being Buddy the Elf. And we start being big-time New York City lawyer who's just as grumpy as everybody else. So when I think of the movie Elf, Think about relentless joy, relentless optimism, standing out in the crowd, being a light in the darkness, even when you don't feel that bright. And then our fifth and final contemporary Christmas tale is It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey's story in It's a Wonderful Life is a profound exploration of what selflessness and sacrifice can do and the impact one individual can have on an entire community. Despite facing numerous challenges and sacrificing his personal dreams, George's life by the end of the film is shown to have a significant positive impact on all of the people around him. And in the film's climax, where George sees what life would have been like without him, we understand, finally, the importance of what one person, of what one soul, the impact that one Christian can have on the world. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. You see, drawing our inspiration from George Bailey, we're reminded that the importance is recognizing two things. Recognizing our own worth, the impact that we can have, the value we bring to a community, to a society, to a family, and recognizing the value and the worth of those who are around us. Recognizing that, yes, maybe we can say we're special because we have an impact on other people, but that other person is just as special, just as impactful, just as powerful as we are because they impact the same people that we do. Everybody is a living soul, and every soul is important. And that includes those, of, those souls that are what we would call family, those souls that what we would call strangers, and those souls in which we would refer to ourselves as I. You are important, because everybody is. And so those are the five lessons that I wanted to focus on tonight. Those are the five lessons that I sat down at my desk on Tuesday morning, and I sat down and I looked at it and I said, these are five important topics that have nothing to do with each other, other than they're all taken from classic Christmas tales. And by the time by Friday came around, I realized that these lessons have more in common than I thought. See, as we reflect on these lessons from classic and modern Christmas stories, I think we see a theme, a theme that is woven throughout all of this holiday season, a theme of redemption, a theme of faith, a theme of joy, a theme of selflessness. I think we see the theme, I think we recognize that in the month of December and probably only in the month of December, the whole world around us, or at least a large portion of it, values the same things that we as Christians are told to value. The world finally, for one month a year, values the same things that our Father finds important. For one month a year, the whole world recognizes the values and the teachings that the Son of God came to earth to try to imbue in his followers. And I think it would be silly of us to be like the world, to only focus on these important values and characteristics and lessons for one month a year. Because we are Christians 24-7, 365, 12 months a year. And yet sometimes it feels like we only care about these certain qualities, these certain characteristics, 
one out of 12 months a year. So tonight, I leave you with a challenge. Think about what you find important in the holiday season, what you find important in Christmas, what you find important in your personal walk, in your personal relationship with God, in your personal relationship with your studies, in your own personal relationship and understanding of your salvation. Find what you find valuable. Recognize what is important and find ways in your daily life to exhibit those characteristics. Because these reflections not only reflect who we ought to be, they reflect how we got to where we are. And I think everybody here in this room is a Christian. I think everybody here in this room has been baptized, has joined God's family, has become a member of his church. I think everybody here understands what it means to wear the name Christ, understands what it means when you go out into the world and say, I am a Christian, I am of Christ, I am a follower of the Son of God who came to earth to die for the sins of the whole world in order that people, all people, the human race, have an opportunity to be reunited, creator and creation. I think we all here in this room understand the great burden that that name tag can be if you don't live up to it. The great burden to God's cause that it could become if you don't value the things that God does. And I think those in this room also understand the importance of what it means to be a Christian, to wear that name with pride, to imbue, imbue those positive characteristics into the world. So tonight I leave you with that challenge. Go out into the world, find what makes your faith important, find what the world values in this holiday season, and spread it 24-7, 365. If you're not a Christian and you need to be brought into the church, now is the time to take those steps. Or if you are a Christian and you've realized that you have not been living like a Christian 12 months a year and you've only been living like a Christian one, maybe two, if you count November, months of the year, if you feel as if you haven't always been who you ought to be or you were at one point and now you feel as if you've been beaten down and defined by a cynical world to blend in, and you need to change, you need the prayers of the congregation, you need to study, you need a shoulder to cry on, lean on, talk to. Whatever your needs are, if there's any way the body here can help you tonight, I encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing together. Thank you so much.